I'm very happy to uh, begin to introduce Drs. Ellen DeRouge and Genevieve Fuji Johnson uh, from the Department of Political Studies. Uh, they will be talking about something important to us all, indeed how we can enhance the capacity of our social sciences to provide evidence to actually tackle those wicked problems. Uh, they will talk to you today about a complex set of uh, recommendations, but the answer is not going through the traditional systems of ethics governance in universities, or nor is the answer in the general movements to open data as it is in the United States. To craft the answer, we need to ask better questions of ourselves and understand more about the way that knowledge is produced. The title of their talk today, as you can see on the screen, is The Full Monty, Your Evidence Laid Bare in Inclusive and Diverse Political Science. And they have remarkably collaborated with two other professors in the Department of Political Science for a forthcoming article which will appear in the Canadian Journal of Political Science, the special 50th anniversary edition coming out later this year. So the article will be available uh, upon a request. Please do not cite um, without the author's permission. Certainly calls for inclusion have never been higher, as we have seen across a wide coalition of equity groups for the March on Washington this past weekend. And it will be important to ensure that these groups do not pay a hidden cost in movements towards data access. Before I speak about the professional background of our speakers, I want to underline that the ideas they present today are original, and indeed this was one of the purposes of the Fast Speakers Forum. They represent the out outcome of a special collaboration amongst the two of them and Drs. Mark Pickup and Remy Leger uh, for this series and for the Canadian Political Science Association. Uh, Ellen DeRouge, I will introduce first, uh, came to SFU in 2012 from the University of Oxford. And Dr. DeRouge's research interests concern comparative politics, the intersection of political behavior, and patterns of formal and informal mobilization with differing political institutional cultures, as well as the political engagement of minority and min marginal groups. She also has a special interest in the field of experimental research. Genevieve Fuji Johnson on my left has a doctorate from the University of Toronto and teaches democratic theory, feminist political thought, and theories related to sexuality and gender and interpretive uh, approaches to policy analysis. Dr. Johnson's recent book um, from U of T Press in 2015 is entitled Democratic Illusion, Deliberative Democracy in Canadian Public Policy. She is chair of the Graduate Program in Political Science and also an associate faculty member of the Department of Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies and an associate of the Dialogue Program in the Morris J. Walk Center. In addition to all of that, she is a member of the Safufa Executive Committee and FAS is especially indebted to Jean Viev for her uh, generous volunteering for the Sexual Assault Working Group uh, to the benefit of the wider uh, SFU community. She will have to leave immediately after. I do want to invite you all after this session to join us for an informal pizza and polemic, which will be out in the front hall. The agenda for today is to begin with their presentations of about 20 to 25 minutes, and then turn it over to two excellent students from political science, uh, Cornel Tordino uh, and uh, Jaslyn Melnichuk, uh, both students in political science who have been involved with their student union in the past and are actively involved uh, with the NATO simulation, simulation project with Dr. Moynes, the chair. Uh, we are really uh, happy they're able to participate and they will be animating the discussion period afterwards. So join me please in welcoming Dr. DeRouge and Johnson. Thank you both. Thank you. Well, thank you all of you uh, for coming out this morning. It's nice to see you. Um, so uh, again, I'm Genevieve. And I'm Alina. And the title of our talk is The Full Monty, Your Evidence Laid Bare in an Inclusive and Diverse Political Science. Um, so as we know, uh, less than a week ago, uh, Donald Trump became the 45th president of the United States. And as we've seen, as we've witnessed with his uh, campaign for the Republican nomination, with his campaign for the presidency, and now with the presidency, we've seen this sweeping in, a sweeping in of what's been called a post-truth politics. A politics in which feelings, 
and in particular, negative feelings come to dominate. And facts, verifiable or established facts, are blatantly and seemingly routinely cast aside. And so Alina and I have been thinking about uh, a question on which we'd like to engage with you uh, today in, in the hour that we have with you. And that question is, what can we do as political scientists, as students of politics, what can we do to combat post-truth politics, to bring us back to the facts, to bring us back to evidence, to bring us back to sound argument uh, and good analysis, and to continue to try, as we do, students of politics and political scientists, to ensure that we have good laws, good public policies, and good institutions. What does political science have to offer the post-truth world? Of course, we all have opinions. If you're students of political science, uh, many of you, we have so many opinions about virtually everything. I think a good way of organizing our opinions is into two categories, uh, the normative uh, and the empirical. So we have opinions about normative questions. And my background is in political theory. I'm a, a trained political theorist uh, interested in issues of public policy. But in political theory, uh, one of the most uh, uh, common or, or a, a perennial question, normative question or should question, is this. How should we govern ourselves? By what laws, policies, and institutions should we govern ourselves? Another perennial question or a set of questions has to do with ethics, both, both personal ethics as well as public ethics. So how should those in office, those in high office, like the presidency of the United States, comport themselves, both privately and publicly? Another question has to do with the right to have a presence to demonstrate, as possibly a number of you did over the weekend on Saturday. When should we exercise this fundamental democratic right to protest, to demonstrate? Another question has to do with when should we take this a step, for, for, uh, a step further and revolt or rise up? When should we rise up? and engage in revolution to overcome government. So these are normative questions. But we also have all sorts of opinions regarding empirical questions, the types of questions that are about what is. Um, and that's more my area of research. So questions like, who is likely to vote for a particular party or politician? Um, what are the determinants generally when we're talking about voter choice? How is it that the polls got it wrong when it came to uh, the distribution of the popular vote and who got elected, uh, Trump over Hillary. Did they actually de get it wrong? And actually many argue they didn't. So why do we still have that dialogue out there? To what extent is populism on the rise? There's been a lot of discussion about populism. To what extent is it actually on the rise? And questions like what were the motivations of those individuals who joined the Women's March on on Washington this Saturday uh, for doing so. So these are the kind of what is questions that political science also engages with. But politics, in a politics that relies on fake news and on lies, and we see that running rampant is the argument lately, what can we do to separate and sift through such questions uh, and to ensure that sound arguments based on good reasoning uh, and systematically collected and considered evidence prevails? What in particular, again, does political science have to offer? Well, in order to respond this, to this question, we first have to start with what do we mean by political science? And that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean, it's true. Alina and I have been in this business of political science for quite a number of years. Uh, and I think it's, it's, well, it's not uncommon for myself to take basic terms for granted. And so this is an opportunity for us to reflect on the politics, the political, uh, and the science part of political science. 
Um, so again, my background is in uh, political theory. Uh, and so when responding to these big questions, uh, when thinking through sort of you know, what I'm doing in this discipline, I often go to the ancients um, for inspiration. Um, so we have this uh, famous, uh, a, a detail from this famous uh, fresco, the School of Athens, and we have uh, Plato gesturing upward and Aristotle, more empirical, gesturing downward. Aristotle, uh, as he put it, and I'm very loosely paraphrasing here, for him, the political had to do with the affairs of the polis, the polis, the city, the city-state, or the political collectivity. Um, a more contemporary definition of uh, politics comes from Harold Laswell uh, in the early part of the 20th century, in the 1930s. He had put it, as he put it, politics is about who gets what, when, and how. But the city, the city-state, and today the contemporary state we know are very porous entities. And we can see this quite vividly in international trade. But we can also see this in terms of how the state organizes itself internally in terms of the public-private divide. As feminists have long pointed out, the private, the personal, is public and it is political. So bodies, we know, are politicized. Sexual orientation is politicized. Gender roles are politicized. Uh, and so on. But what about the science part, right? Because science, we tend to see as something fairly modern. Or did the ancients actually have to say something about that? It's interesting you should raise that question. <laughs> so with Aristotle, we see a prototypical scientist, a prototypical natural scientist. He wrote about biology, he wrote about physics, and a prototypical social scientist. He was uh, very concerned with engaging himself in the systematic collection and documentation of evidence. And in the case of his political works, uh, this evidence took the form of constitutions. Uh, constitutions of city-states, uh, actual city-states, and it's true, uh, uh, imagined city-states and mythical city-states. But nonetheless, he collected hundreds of them, upon which he uh, made generalizations and developed a theory about the best, as in the ideal state, the best possible state, and the most common forms of government. Um, much later in the 20th century, uh, in the post-war era, we really start to see the science part of political science really take off with uh, the collection of data, observation, replication, and so on. But let's just stay here uh, in the ancient world for just a little, little longer, uh, because in my opinion, uh, this is uh, where we have the roots for our contemporary discipline of political science. Aristotle and before him Plato uh, were both very deeply concerned with the relationship between actual politics in the empirical realm or the visible realm, to use Plato's language, uh, and normative ideals in the intelligible realm. Um, in one of Plato's uh, most fascinating dialogues, uh, The Republic, uh, we see him, we see Plato seeking out the truth with respect to two basic questions. What is justice and how should we achieve it? Uh, and he did this by engaging his characters in a dialogue, Socrates and anyone else? The might is right guy? Those of you who, yes, eyes are lighting up. Starts with a T. Uh, Thrasymachus. Right, and the brothers of, of Plato, Glaucon and Adamantus. <laughs> you should all know this if you've taken <laughs> Paul 210. Anyway, <laughs> so this was Plato's approach to, 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 to set up characters in a dialogue and to work through uh, opinions or doxa by questioning uh, these characters and so on, all in the hopes of achieving truth. Aristotle, again, took a different approach. He was more empirical in orientation. But again, he was concerned with normative questions. So again, he engaged in a careful and systematic study of politics and, and constitutions, 
but he was concerned with this overarching question, how best should we govern ourselves? So we see in both scholars uh, a concern with the, the normative questions, but also a concern with a systematic uh, approach to questioning and reasoning in the case of Plato, uh, and in collecting data and analyzing data in the case of Aristotle. And I think both of these approaches to studying politics are very much with us today. Now, many of the big questions that political science grapples with today are not that much different, although we live in a vastly different political and socioeconomic context, of course. So questions are like, where do states come from? And how do they manage to survive in this increasingly globalized world? How do they re remain relevant? What explains war? Uh, questions like, what is the best form of government we've already mentioned? How do we ensure that government represents and also is responsive to a diverse set of voices, uh, voices within uh, its realm? And how do we hold it accountable for its decisions, especially when we see systems of government becoming increasingly complex? How do we balance individual and community needs? Can we have freedom as well as equality? or do we need to make some tough choices in those areas? How can we increase cooperation, not just among individuals, but among states, in order to benefit the common good, however we define what the common good might be? And finally, how can we design and implement policies that benefit that common good? So these are some of the bigger questions that political science grapples with. But at the same time, we've seen this increasing demand in political science for the much smaller targeted questions, partly those that target questions about particular events, like what happened during the last presidential election, how do we understand what happened during that election, but also that are aimed at evaluating the effectiveness and the impact of specific policies. Now, with the Trudeau government, especially in power, we've seen this getting back in fashion of what we call evidence-based policy making. Um, and those are the more targeted questions about how well certain policies, of course, function or will function. Perhaps you could say a little bit more about evidence. I mean, what do contemporary political scientists take as evidence? Well, when we're ta talking about evidence, I mean, we can start by taking the Oxford Dictionary definition, uh, which of course I always tell my students not to just do. But if we start from there, we can say it's the availability of a body of facts or information that indicates whether a belief or a proposition is true or valid. But that definition, and this is why I tell students not to just have a definition like that, of course raises new questions for us as a political science. Um, it raises questions of what we mean by truth and what we mean by reality. It raises questions about what we believe we can actually know about this truth or reality, and how we evaluate knowledge um, to be indicative of this truth. So these are all really big questions uh, that underlie much of what we do in political science. Now on the first, on what do we mean by truth, it will be brief, but generally in political science, um, there's differences of opinions on whether there is a, a real world out there that's distinct from us as researchers and that we can observe like we might do in the natural sciences. On the one hand, there's those who do see uh, that there is this somewhat detached, objective, real world out there that we can observe. Uh, on the other hand, there's those who believe that the world is socially constructed. Now, whereas those in the former perspective who believe that there is such a real world out there um, might see a reality, in a role for that reality in explaining political phenomena and understanding political phenomena, those who see reality as more socially constructed see the relevance of reality only to the extent uh, in which uh, humans understand that reality uh, and interpret political phenomena. Now, building on from that, what does it mean for our beliefs and what we can actually know? Well, those that, again, adhere to the latter perspective and seeing the world as socially constructive also tend to view the researcher, his or herself, as seeing the world through their own socially constructive pair of glasses. Right? And so rather than aiming to discover more law-like generalizations about the world that those researchers undertake, that see the world as more detached from themselves, 
Such researchers um, aim to understand how actors' meaning um, of social phenomena affect the outcomes, affects their decisions, and affects their behaviors, while simultaneously being aware of their own interpretations of this social world. Mm -hmm. Regardless of one's view uh, on the nature of reality or uh, on, on metaphysics, uh, or regardless of one's views on the nature of knowledge, so one's epistemological views, I think gen generally speaking, political scientists all agree on the importance of transparency in our research, in the logic supporting our research, uh, in data collection, um, and in data analysis. After all, if it's not transparent, how can we really believe it? Uh, what stock would we put in uh, a normative or an empirical claim for which we cannot see and comprehend its underlying logic and its evidence? Not much. So in this post-truth world, we as researchers, as scholars, as students, need to be very careful uh, and systematic in our collection and analysis of data and in our reasoning through complex issues, and we need to be as transparent as possible. But this, of course, regardless of whether we are trying to capture some real world out there, or whether we are interested in how humans interpret the political phenomenon and how these interpretations motivate their actions. Now, when we're talking about transparency, mm -hmm. or research openness is a different term for that, this implies providing access to our evidence, our data, as it were. And in political science, we acquire data through different means. So we might do so through standardized questionnaires. You might have had your telephone survey, been called, or of course, opinion polls, political polls, we're very much aware of. Um, but we also might do so by having in-depth conversations one-on-one -on -one with individuals or with small focus groups. It's another way of collecting evidence. We also might observe people in the field, as political science or social scientists might like to call it. Go to businesses or organizations and see how people work, what they do, the actions they take, the motivations they have uh, whilst they're doing it. Or we might actually use data and derive our data from existing sources like government reports or websites. And finally, Political scientists also use experimentation, and this can be either in social science labs, like we have also here at the university, um, or in the field. And this is, of course, for instance, policy experimentation is one example of the types of experiments that political scientists might do, might do what works, what doesn't work. But apart from transparency in, in, as access to our data and access to the evidence, uh, making that available for other people, transparency implies much more. It also implies openness about the logic that we use to make our claims. It also implies openness in how this evidence was collected. Not just access, but also how did you collect the evidence and the data. Openness in how we develop our arguments and in the conclusions regarding our claims uh, and how we draw them from that evidence, so how we connect our evidence to our claims. Now, this transparency is important for many reasons, and some of these might already come to mind. And one of the most obvious ways for reasons why transparency is important is for the advancement of social scientific knowledge. Right? So the development of social scientific knowledge requires researchers to share information about the process that led to their knowledge claims, um, and to have these processes subsequently scrutinized by others, uh, replicated, but also built upon. And that's what social science is all about. So advancing knowledge by simply sharing your conclusions is not enough. We need to show in detail how we reach these conclusions and not just show the end product. Now, this is also important for another reason, and that is that opening up our research process to others will ensure fewer mistakes, whether willful, and we've seen some examples in social science where people are willfully uh, misrepresenting their evidence and their mm -hmm. conclusions, but obviously far more common accidental mistakes that do happen. So by kind of avoiding such mistakes and opening, it, opening our thought process and our research processes up to others, we enhance the credibility and legitimacy, not only of individual studies, 
but also as the, of the discipline as a whole. Now, these are maybe the most obvious kind of reasons when we think about research openness. But there are other, there's some other reasons why research openness is important. And one is that we can see research data as a common good. A lot of political science and social science research in general is funded through public funds, taxpayer money, right? So once you all get jobs, at some point you'll be funding this kind of research. So, hopefully, if, <laughs> if they're still funding it, but I'm sure that's our argument. But as such, policymakers and society as a whole um, can benefit from the sharing of that data, mm -hmm. right? Um, sharing by other academics of that data, but also sharing it with members of society at large. And you could take it even a step further, and arguably, society and policymakers have a right to access, a right to access of data, and a right to evaluate how such data subsequently were used to develop arguments. Now, research openness can also it's another motivation why we should engage in it, decrease the burdens of research that are placed uh, on over-researched and vulnerable populations. For instance, I know that in Aviv you do research and you face this dilemma mm -hmm. uh, when you do your research concerning streets involved sex work, mm -hmm. street-based sex workers mm -hmm. uh, in the downtown east side mm -hmm. of Vancouver, so such vulnerable populations. Um, and, by, and as well as junior researchers who might not have the funds to kind of collect data. So by sharing this evidence and sharing these data sources we have, we ensure that people don't always have to go out and collect their own new evidence, uh, but might be able to look at the existing evidence with a new, new uh, pair of glasses. Right? Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, not only using other people's gathered evidence, but also using that evidence maybe to come up with new questions, novel questions, before starting on their own research process. Now finally, research transparency also has pedagogical value. Also for senior researchers, but also for students like yourself. Being exposed to how data was collected and how this was used to formulate conclusions um, on the basis of that has a huge value for students, too, about learning how research is done. Great. You make a really, really good case for uh, so. research transparency <laughs> and data access. Um, it's very convincing. But I'm wondering if it's possible to have too much transparency. Like, I'm thinking maybe we should hold back on the full Monty. <laughs> it, had to, it was such a great movie uh, <laughs> to get that reference in. Um, but seriously, um, I'm wondering what the limits to transparency might be. So as researchers, uh, of course, um, we have uh, obligations to engage in systematic and careful research and to be as transparent as we can. But we also have obligations to our research participants. And I do uh, a lot of uh, first-person interviews uh, with research participants, and sometimes I spend hours upon end interviewing uh, participants, interviewing people, talking to people, probing their, uh, their thoughts and their opinions and perspectives and so on. Um, and I have to always uphold a basic obligation, a basic uh, obligation in research, which is to respect the privacy and the confidentiality of my uh, research participants and to report on their insights and to incorporate their insights into my work only on the basis of their informed and expressed consent. Sometimes for a range of reasons. Uh, participants don't want to go on the public record. They don't want to have their identities revealed. They could be political dissidents. They could be uh, heavily stigmatized uh, or marginalized or even criminalized. Um, so I think it's important when I'm doing this kind of uh, uh, work, this kind of research, to speak with a broad range of political actors, not just policy elites, not just politicians and policy makers, those with political power, but those on the edge of political power, those without political power, those sort of um, further off in, um, in civil society. But in order to access these communities, there must be trust. 
and we must, as researchers, uphold this basic obligation to respect their privacy and their confidentiality. So this is a hard limit uh, to transparency, where research participants don't consent to having their identities revealed, uh, or don't consent to having their transcripts or their recordings made publicly accessible. And this actually relates to another important limit or problem with transparency, uh, which is raised by that push towards transparency. And that is the question, who actually has the rightful authority to decide um, whether research materials and data are made publicly accessible? Academics tend to pride themselves, and I know we certainly do, on our independence. Mm. And so many would argue that claim that they are in the best position to judge whether um, what, or what the ethical and legal consequences are of releasing certain data and releasing certain consequences. And that decision should therefore made by the researcher, the one who undertook the research, uh, the one who collected the evidence, and not by the government not by funding agencies, and not by editors of the journals in which we publish our work. Right? But there's also another very different limit or critique of transparency, and that is related to the burdens it places on the political science community as a whole. Achieving comprehensive research openness requires resources. It requires money, and it requires time to start with. In order to provide this comprehensive access to both the data and our, the way we make our knowledge claims, uh, we need these resources. Now, this doesn't only apply to individual researchers, it also applies to universities, and it also, again, applies to journals, academic journals. For instance, if we want to store and have publicly available our data, we need databases. Someone needs to maintain these databases. Someone needs to pay for these databases. We're looking at potentially a whole lot of data. Right? And this is a costly undertaking to manage and to have these sorts of databases mm -hmm. to store uh, both our, um, our rationale and our decisions, but also the actual data itself. And when it comes to individual researchers, we also know that time spent on opening up our research process in a way that other people can understand it and doing that more elaborate, opening up uh, our evidence also requires time and this time takes away from additional publications. And in the academic world, publications are so important. So there has to then be a shift in appreciation of where the time and the effort goes. Mm -hmm. Now, this problem of burdens is exacerbated because it's not equally shared among researchers. It's not equally shared among institutions. Institutions who have the money, researchers who have the money, um, and those who do have not. So if we think of younger or underfunded researchers and institutions will of course suffer more from this burden than those who have the resources. And in addition to that, a new generation of scholars, and hopefully we have some, some of you here, um, the worry is that the, these scholars might shy away from questions that are looking to be requiring a lot of resources in time of t data, managing data, gathering, um, as well as the more kind of sensitive questions that would lead them into waters of difficulty with data openness. Uh, so the types of questions we looked at at sensitive and vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a, a really interesting discussion that you and I have been having recently, and also with Mark and Rami as we've worked on our paper on data access and research transparency. Um, they're really getting us to think about our discipline, to think about political science, and to think about how this, this discipline, which is very diverse, um, how we can reach the ideals of uh, research openness. Um, political science, again, is very diverse, uh, and through uh, large end studies, surveys, smaller case studies, interviews, focus groups, experiments, and so on, um, we're enabled uh, uh, to respond to the big juicy questions as well as the, the, the smaller, more policy-focused questions, both empirical questions as well as normative questions. But really, in order to tackle these questions and to tackle them well and convincingly, 
Uh, we need to be very systematic in our collection and analysis of evidence, logical in our argumentation, and as widely transparent as possible. And the process through which we answer our questions and our openness about that process is an important part of what makes us experts, people who trade in knowledge rather than pundits who trade in opinions. Political science's response to post-truth politics really relies on the systematic and transparency, on the systematic and transparency in this post-truth world that uh, consists of what has recently been dubbed alternative facts. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
resource argument, right? Mm -hmm. um, so at the moment, what's happening with journals who are enforcing certain standards, um, the wealthier journals, and it's maybe maybe only two or three in our discipline, um, I know one of them, our top second journal, actually hires a company to look at your files and the way you came to your conclusions, especially when it comes to quantitative work, which is in that sense easier to evaluate. Um, but that's costly and, and that's also time consuming. Um, but it is a very good question, who, who enforces, who will look? That's partly cost, but it also gets into that issue of who gets a say. Right? And so far, um, we also know that fund, the major funding agencies, like SHRC we have here, um, is slowly starting to push for more transparency. They're still fairly open in, in how they define that, but they do have an expectation if you get funds that you'll try to um, have your data ac accessible to the public. And so they're trying to make these demands. So the way they're currently starting to be enforced is through mainly journals for your mm -hmm. publications. You can't publish without it, mm -hmm. in certain journals at least. Um, and through funding agencies slowly starting to make demands and otherwise you don't get funds. So I think those are the major changes we've seen. I think it's a really fascinating question. Like, um, so the DART discussion in the US has been very contentious. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there is a sensible way of, uh, again, uh, being as accessible as possible with our research and our data for all of the benefits that, that you nicely outlined. Um, advancing knowledge, uh, enhancing legitimacy, decreasing burdens on over-researched populations and so on, while also letting us scholars as academics be academics and exercise our academic freedom. Um, and so I'm hoping that there's less enforcement per mm -hmm. se and more sort of, um, I'm hoping that there will be acceptance on the part of uh, article, uh, journal, journals and funding agencies for the diversity of approaches that we can take uh, depending on our subfields mm -hmm. and our methodologies toward realizing. And that's an important openness. point, because it is important to realize that a lot of this discussion has come out of the political science community. So it's also about changing norms and changing ways we do things as a community. And that, of course, is an ideal scenario where you don't need an enforcer as such if you just have a changing change of norms. All right, my turn. Okay. Uh, I have a more broad question. Uh, since uh, academia is worldwide and since uh, Canadian academics are being published in the United States and Europe and uh, other academics are coming from all over the world uh, being published in our journals. Should the discussion take on a broader aspect and incorporate different countries? You want to take this one first? Or if you want to. Well, so the big movement started in the US and it's affecting us and this is partly why we wrote this article and saying, well, we're, how do we respond as political science? Does it, in Canada, does this apply to us? And, and it does, because a lot of the journals are US based. But in Europe, we slowly see changes too. And now the UK is an interesting example where in some ways the UK is further along, partly because government um, is far more involved with kind of trying to drive and stipulate the types of research that's being done. So there's a lot more kind of strings attached already to the money received. So in certain ways, certain people have argued that the UK is, has already, without using DART or things as terminology, has already moved into the, the data access part especially. And so a lot of the international discussion has been focused on just accessibility of data. But one of the things we are trying to point out too is that it's much broader than that. It's also the accessibility of the thought process and the way you derive your conclusions and being very clear about the logic that underlies that. So it's certainly something that is internationally happening too. Um, and the EU, for instance, has the European Union has large funding grants, and they're kind of again trying to instill this too. I don't think there's been many conversations specifically in Europe on this topic, but certainly European political scientists have been involved with discussions in the in the US too. Yeah, and again, it's it's a complex issue. Again, we we want transparency, but there are limitations, and so a point that we. Um, we develop uh, in our paper um, <clears throat> a point that was, you know, expressed by one of our co-authors, Remy Leger, was, you know, this uh, movement toward uh, research transparency also cre creates burdens for 
for uh, researchers and scholars and students whose language, uh, whose first language is not English, right? And so that could be a kind of, I mean, perverse consequence, if you will. I mean, we already see this, I think, in the non-English speaking world and academia, this pressure to public and publish in English language venues, journals. And so this pressure might be amplified. Uh, and so that's something we want to be careful about. So again, it's a complex issue. It's an ideal we want to strive for, but we want to be careful in how we do that. Okay. And I think, uh, so I'll ask my last question now, and then we'll, oh, you, okay, <laughs> you can have two more questions, then we'll turn it to the audience. But um, my question is about uh, the political science community um, and sort of from your observances, maybe there's been some data gathered on it, how have they reacted to such um, initiatives? Are they um, positive towards it, or maybe do they see it as uh, academic infringement, or how do they react to it? That way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> positive and an infringement, an imposition. I mean, I think generally speaking, have there been studies? I don't believe there have been. There's been informal kind of, yeah. through our organizations and our organizational meetings, there's been kind of, there's been a petition, for instance, that was very anti-data mm -hmm. access and research transparency movement. There's a bunch of American political scientists got together and signed a petition saying it's moving too fast. We don't agree with some of these principles. We have concerns. Um, so there's anecdotal evidence. There's, there hasn't been a big survey, but there's some sense that there's definitely in a certain uh, people in the community a concern. And we'll see, once our article comes out, <laughs> hopefully we'll get a sense of, of whether this actually is, a, is an issue or how people think in the political science community in Canada yeah. in particular. So and the dialogue in Canada begins. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, just a, a personal anecdote. I remember, um, so this was at the American Political Science Association meeting in San Francisco, which was in 2015, is that right? I believe so, yeah. Yes. Um, and I was sitting at a table, and we were out for drinks and so on with a bunch of other uh, interpretivists, those of us who uh, engage in this kind of interpretive approach to policy analysis, policy studies, and someone mentioned DART. And I, my initial reaction was, really? Like, I. <laughs> It just sounded like so much of a burden in terms of the workload mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, and then also raising ethical questions. So my initial reaction wasn't positive. But the more I've thought about the importance of going transparent and, and the importance of being careful in how we each, depending on our subfields, realize that transparency, I think, I think on the whole it's uh, a positive move. All right, my final question. It's actually two questions. Um, so I was wondering, first of all, if Canada were to implement similar sort of guidelines to DART uh, in their institutions and in their journals, do you think that it should be taught at the undergraduate level in the research methods classes? And the second part of this question is, how do you think that ap applying DART-related guidelines in Canada would affect the credibility of publications done before the guidelines were implemented. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. right. So as an undergrad question, yes, 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 of course. Um, I think especially again in this, this idea of the post-truth world and where we have so much news coming at us or fake news coming at us, I think it's very important that we just generally teach young people to separate and to judge quality of news, quality of facts. Um, and as part of that, as we've argued, is also thinking about what constitutes good evidence and the process by which that is derived. So I think, frankly, in this world, I think it's a life skill. And I think people should be taught that. Um, so very much a yes. As When it comes to discrediting or, or, or viewing lesser quality of previous studies, mm -hmm. I'm not too worried about that to some extent in the sense that we all know they were published before that era. Um, and sometimes the ideas they generate are still interesting, um, even if we can't maybe assess to our current criteria whether, they're, uh, whether we can replicate them or whether we can fully understand the way they derive those conclusions. Um, they are still useful in terms of building future research programs, testing ideas further, um, and just can still be very insightful. Mm -hmm. Okay, All right. so I think we'll uh, turn it to the audience now and if uh, we have any questions, we'd, uh, we'd take them now. Yes. Um, 
Thank you for the uh, presentation. It was great. Zavakot, you've spoken a lot about the burdens this transparency and openness can place on researchers. I want to take it in a slightly different direction. What about the burden it could place on you and people essentially just taking your data and getting their own? You also spoke about the benefits of publications, how it is the currency of the PhD these days. When you spend hours doing your interviews, Genevieve or Alina, when you spend the money and time building your experiments, running your experiments, is there going to be a disincentive to do that now, knowing that, okay, you've done this, you get your one publication, then you have to make all your data accessible, and then someone like me can come along, hey, 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 I can build off of all of your hard work and just throw out my own publication without doing the hard work, without putting in the time and effort that you had to in actually building that data set. Is that going to create a bit of a disincentive to do some of this work? Certainly, and I think that's one of the concerns, right? And that's one of the concerns for new scholars. Are, are we steering away from, from the, the hard work, the kind of going to certain countries, doing extensive field work, when you come back after like spending two years in the field of your PhD, meticulously documenting everything and then your first publication, and then they run off with your data. Right? On the other hand, I think, so this is also where there is a request for change, in the sense that I think, there are ways of dealing with that. There has been talk of having a moratorium on data for a few years and saying, okay, if you've generated it, if you can make an argument of putting so much time and effort in, maybe we can talk about having for two years or three years exclusive rights to data, right? So there's ways of dealing with that. Um, but then there's also the question of, of funding and, and, and help for people in order to, um, in order to kind of Sorry, don't know where I was going with that. I had another point. <laughs> you want to jump in? I'll jump in. I think on my second point. <clears throat> um, I mean, sure, it's a concern, but I don't think it's as big a concern, especially if we can uh, encourage journals and data repositories to issue digital object identifiers uh, for our work, right? And so when you publish. Uh, uh, anything online, you get a, what's known as a DOI. Um, and that's a number that stays with the work. Uh, and so ideally, I mean, I, I would be flattered, you know, if you were to take my, you know, years work, you know, interviews and so on, and to, to analyze that material. Uh, and you gave me credit for it. Right. As, so that so that would be an example of sort of your building on the work that I've done. Um, I do think it is really really important uh, to get out in the field and to talk to people. But again, we we do know that there are oversampled populations, um, and uh, so I also think that it's important. Uh, to be really prepared, well prepared, if you're going back to those populations, that you have new novel questions uh, um, to explore with them. Thank you. That was my second point okay. related, to, related to changing the way we give credit in political science mm -hmm. and, and a lot of social sciences. We get judged on our number of publications or, and or the quality of publications. But one part, I think, changing a shift of focus on saying data is a publication, especially mm -hmm. when it comes with a lot of documentation and things that people can reuse. So kind of shifting where we, how we give credit in the community. Mm -hmm. Just, right. Any other questions? Uh, is transparency a vital response to a post trade world if it we consume and trust to send ways of alternative facts can afford to access post-secondary spaces and benefit from the sharing of knowledge? Is it just a trickle-down approach assuming that transparency will benefit marginalized populations when really academics need these things to survive and perform in this Can you say that one more time? Well, sorry. Um, <laughs> is, it loud, um, is transparency a vital response to a post truth world when really the people who consume um, alternative facts cannot afford, sometimes cannot afford to access the post-secondary post spaces and benefit from the sharing of knowledge? I think it's an excellent question. Yeah. Um, and when expressed in those terms, you know, I think the response has to be no, it's not sufficient. Uh, not uh, in the, you know, sort of political economic context that we currently have. Um, but I also think, as researchers, it's our obligation to be as transparent as possible, and also as educators, um, to be 
you know, encouraging our students and to be teaching them about the importance of being transparent so that when they go out into uh, the communities, they can spread that uh, importance as well. I mean, it is a problem, combined with the fact that research is slow. Mm -hmm. right? So we're always running after the facts as academics, because if you want to do it meticulously, it takes time. So I think that exacerbates the problem you mentioned in terms of getting it, getting it out there and getting it particular to people um, who are maybe not plugged in to the elites and the, yeah. uh, in society. So I think that's another challenge for academics. And I think one that a lot of academics, I know certainly myself, still struggle with. We were just talking about media training and, and getting out there and kind of trying to provide a counterweight uh, through more accessible channels. That is a challenge for a lot of academics. And how do you then, your meticulously derived conclusions, how do you then still do justice to them but simplify them mm -hmm. right, in a way that they're clear. And I think that is a, a, a big challenge.